I am going to talk about character. I just want to make sure I have my materials in order so I don't get messed up. Um, I always feel a little funny uh, holding forth on topics like this because as a writer, I don't really think in terms of craft per se. Uh, I tend to write pretty unconsciously, at least my first drafts, and um, while I do years and years of editing trying to kind of tame those and shape them into something that's tolerable, uh, I don't really use for myself terms like voice, description, characterization, point of view. Um, and I, I, I actually find that there's something sort of artificial even about separating those, those um, terms, those elements of craft from each other because in reality, right, in fiction, they interact like systems in the living organism and they work together to animate the writing. Um, for example, strong dialogue is obviously an essential part of good characterization, but conversely, really good dialogue is good because every line is revealing of character. So even separating those two concepts feels kind of academic. Um, still, there's plenty to be learned from this approach, um, slightly artificial though it may be, to figure out how to do what we do better, which is what I'm always trying to figure out. Um, so, Today, I want to look together at different kinds of characterization that we encounter in fiction and the elements that I think make them strong. And at the same time, I want to notice the ways in which character, characterization interacts with some el other elements of cra other craft systems to strengthen a work of fiction. One thing that I'm always thinking about, um, not so much when I write, which again I do in a pretty unthinking state, that's really how I get my raw material, but when I edit, which I do endlessly over years, is how to get language to do the greatest number of possible things at one time. The whole enterprise is really an exercise in compression. How to make something small, and even a novel is small compared with a life or, or many lives, how to make that small thing suggest a larger world in all of its complexity. So in the case of a character, the challenge is how can we suggest a whole human being, all the textures of an individual life and history in as economical a way as possible. One artif article of faith about characterization that I'd like to toss out immediately because I think it's totally wrong and misleading is the notion of consistency as a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that we're trying to do, what, what we're trying to do is establish a character and keep that person in character over time. I, I think that where that idea originates is actually a truth about fiction, which is that we're always trying to walk a razor's edge between surprise and inevitability. Some of the best fictional moments, as I think all of us as readers know, are the ones that seem to contain both. That delicious jolt of not having seen something coming and yet feeling instantaneously that not only is it exactly the right thing, but that in some way we've been expecting it all along. It's the balance of surprise with inevitability that's critical though. If you veer too far into the realm of surprise, you end up with lurches that seem arbitrary because the reader's unprepared for them. And what we feel in those moments is the heavy hand of the writer manipulating the action. So I think that advocates of consistent characters are trying to ward off those nonsensical seeming lurches. But if you err too far on the inevitability side of that thin line, you end up in territory that feels predictable and formulaic. My least favorite thing. And that is the problem, in my opinion, with so-called consistent characters. They feel familiar, not because we've met them before, but because they are types. Because the thing about real people is that they're not consistent. <laughs> there may be a certain consistency to our behavior and choices, but, these quali but the qualities inside us that lead to those behaviors and choices are almost always conflicting qualities. And getting at the particular conflicts at work in an individual is the critical job of characterization, the, the number one job in my opinion. The second thing about consistency that makes it an unhelpful goal is that it contradicts the effects of time. 
So time is always passing in life and in a work of fiction, and therefore stasis is not really possible. Even someone who hasn't changed reads differently, both on the page and in the world. I think we all know some people like this. After time has passed, the same set of qualities registers very differently in a young person, for example, um, than it does in an older person, because the world around that person has changed even if they haven't. So successful fiction, to my mind, owns those changes and controls them rather than trying to impose, establish, and then sustain an artificial stasis. Now, someone who wanted to basically blow away everything I've just said can do it in two words, Jane Austen. <laughs> The characters in Jane Austen's novels are completely consistent, and they actually don't change over time, even though they do learn things. You might even call them predictable, and that, mind-bogglingly, is a delight in Austen's work and contributes to its dynamic and superb quality. How she pulled that off, I still don't know. It's, to me, one of the great literary mysteries is why, how her novels can be so good. They shouldn't work, and yet they work better than almost anything else, which is why another thing I strongly believe is that there really are no rules at all in fiction writing, um, despite what people standing at podiums might tell you. If you can pull it off, more power to you. However, for us mortals, in general, in my opinion, Surprise and contradiction tend to work better. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about on the most basic level, I'm going to read the introduction to a character in the story Dance in America by Lori Moore from her 1998 collection, Birds of America, an excellent book. The narrator is, um, is visiting a friend whose son is very ill with cystic fibrosis. When I first knew Cal, we were in New York, just out of graduate school. He was single and anxious, and struck me as someone who would never actually marry and have a family, or, if he did, would marry someone decorative, someone slight. Here's the characterization. But now, 12 years later, his silver-haired wife, Simone, is nothing like that. She is big and fierce and original, joined with him in grief and courage. She storms out of PTA meetings. She glues little sequins to her shoes. English is her third language. She was once a French diplomat to Belgium and to Japan. I miss the caviar, is all she'll say of it. I miss the caviar so much. Now, in Pennsylvania Dutchland, she paints satirical oils of long-armed, handless people. The locals, she explains in her French accent, giggling, but I can't paint hands. So what we have here is a cascade of surprises. Each observation sets up an expectation that the next observation obliterates. So we know that this, the, this couple is an ill child, a big, fierce wife who is, uh, who, who is joined with her husband in grief and courage, storming out of PTA meetings. That conjures a certain kind of person. She glues little sequins to her shoes, immediately undercuts that, that sort of, you know, uniformly fierce impression. Um, and, uh, and then we don't know until the next sentence that she's not American. English is her third language. She was once a French diplomat to Belgium and Japan. Again, we have to kind of reorient. And, and that conjures someone serious, a, you know, a diplomat with a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a strong career in international relations. I miss the caviar, is all she'll say of it. So again, boom, she just cuts that off at the knees. And uh, I miss the caviar so much. Now in Pennsylvania Dutchland, she paints satirical oils of long arm handless people, which again sort of conjures a, a kind of I art idea, an artsy idea about handlessness, but then we learn that she can't paint hands. So again and again, um, the, an observation is undercut, and yet, oddly, the overall portrayal is amplified with every single contradiction. Each time you could say, that's not consistent, and you would be right, but the inconsistency is exactly what makes the portrait exciting and alive, because this is actually how people are. 
Moore doesn't have time to give us this person's backstory. This, I have just read you the entire introduction to this character. That now it's a short story. She's got to keep it moving. Um, but she she does it. We get it. We don't really need any more on this woman. We can just see her in motion. Um, and that kind of compression matters even more in short stories. There's just very little time for a lot of exposition, but it, she makes that unnecessary. So what I've just read to you is what I would call an, an initial characterization. We've never met this person before, and it's our first look at her. Initial characterizations are essentially descriptions, and this is where the boundaries between those two craft elements begin to collapse. Good description is good, because it reveals as much about the observer as it does about the person or thing being observed. The ideal is what I would often find myself calling with my students last semester at NYU, two-way description, meaning that something or someone is being described and the quality and choices of language reveal to the reader the character of the observer as well. So we're basically learning two things at once. Edith Wharton was a master of initial characterizations that tell us as much about the observer as the person being observed. The House of Mirth, one of my favorite books ever, published in 1905, is told in third person from multiple points of view, but the overarching sensibility is pretty closely allied with Wharton's protagonist, Lily Bart. And I'm going to read a very short uh, initial characterization, a description of um, a woman named Bertha Dorset. She was smaller and thinner than Lily Bart, with a restless pliability of pose, as if she could have been crumpled up and run through a ring, like the sinuous draperies she affected. Her small, pale face seemed the mere setting of a pair of dark, exaggerated eyes, of which the vis visionary gaze contrasted curiously with her self-assertive tone and gestures, so that, as one of her friends observed, she was like a disembodied spirit who took up a great deal of room. So first of all, it's just excellent description. She comes across vividly and colorfully, her wriggly physicality, the, the kinds of clothes she wears, and her vibe, which is certainly not a word Wharton would have used, but, um, but what hinges basically on a contrast between her self-assertive tone and gestures and her kind of um, ethereal visionary gaze. And we have two powerful similes that you could um, run her through a ring and uh, a disembodied spirit. So that's a lot to do in a tiny little paragraph. Um, but there's also a second layer of description that this thumbnail is achieving at exactly the same time, and that is a description of Lily Bart seeing this woman. We, there's humor. We know that she has a sort of a, um, a funny take on the world around her. There's a kind of irony and, a, and even a teasing quality, but a generous one. It's not a mean-spirited portrayal. Um, it also strongly suggests uh, Lily's status as a witness and an observer in a world that she's also deeply rooted in. So she's looking at Bertha from a kind of distance, but it's very clear that she, ha she understands what is said about Bertha. She's one of the gang. 